And welcome back to the footy show. Depression affects one in five people, and if you're not a sufferer, there's a likelihood that someone you care about is. There's a stigma attached to depression, and suicide can be perceived as selfish. But depression is a disease and not something you should be frightened about. We're trying to destigmatise the issue in rugby league, but players are still in an environment where mental toughness, being one of the boys, resilience, are almost performance descriptors. This is an issue I feel strongly about, having personally had my own battle with what I call the black cloud, something I decided to speak publicly about with Andrew Denton back in 2005. Getting through the other side is about being brave enough to speak out and to seek help. Sadly, we lost two young players to suicide last year. That's too, too many. In this special footy show story, we're trying to break the cycle and give hope to anyone who may be suffering. Retired rugby league hero Preston Campbell was an icon in our game, one of our most respected and loved players. He achieved it all during his 14-year career. Watching you as a player, you look like the happiest player out there. Were you always happy in playing? I was always happy a, a lot of the time. I played for 14 years, I think, mm -hmm. um, and for, I dare say, 13. 13 of those years, you know, probably some of the best times of my life. But with the highs come the lows, and for Preston, that came in 2001. A series of changes at his club left him unsure of his future. And for a man that played rugby league as a way to provide for his family, the threat of losing that left him feeling disillusioned and lost. I didn't know where my spot was or my place was in rugby league. Um, I didn't know whether I, I belonged in, the, in rugby league anymore. Um, I just felt like I, I didn't want to be around there anymore. And the struggle, was it mainly around the football club at the time or was that bleeding into your personal life? I kind of started coming home moody, depressed, mm. upset all the time. The kids and, and, and my partner at the time, um, she, they were all invisible to me. So wow. I didn't know at the time that I was, uh, that I was neglecting them. And um, it's just strange looking back now. Um, I just couldn't see myself mm. being that person. Mm. You know, um, yeah, it's just a very, very tough. What did you think was going on at the time? I had no idea. I just thought that I wasn't needed. Um, I thought that I was no good. Um, I felt like I was worth worthless. Um, that nobody needed me around anymore, and um, yeah, it was just so, so dark. Preston's life was sinking lower and lower. He'd just split up with his partner, Lee, and two children, Jaden and Taylor. And it was on this country road just outside of Ballina, with feelings of utter confusion and anger, that Preston took matters into his own hands. He deliberately and consciously drove himself into a tree at 80 k's an hour, the intention to end his life. Where exactly are we? Um, well, this is basically where the the accident had happened. Um, this tree. is the tree that um, almost put an end to me. Okay, what do you remember after you hit the tree? I remember just before I hit the tree, there was a car coming over, and I hit the tree, and I, I put my seatbelt back on, and they parked on the other side. And that was the first first man. I mean, I never never got his name. I don't know who he was. It's kind of weird actually standing here now. We've been here for a little while talking about it because I, I myself, haven't showed anyone. I was really, I didn't really have time to, um, I guess, come back. Or I don't know whether I had the courage to come back and and just actually stand here and think, mate, you're very very lucky. Wrong. Being here in the exact spot which could have ended Preston's life is eerie enough. But what happens next is one of the most amazing coincidences I have ever seen. While we're filming, a man pulls up to speak to us. He explains that it was his car that pulled over that night. This is the man that saved Preston's life. His is the voice that Preston remembers. 
Finally meeting each other after 12 years, the emotion that comes flooding back for both of them is extraordinary. Can I just say thank you? Jesus, mate. Sorry, I'm just, please, I'm, I'm, when I arrived here about seven or eight years ago, you were, I couldn't get a pulse and I couldn't get a new breath or anything and I, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. I just seriously thought you were dead and I grabbed your head really carefully and put, tilted your head back and you started, you coughed and you started to breathe and I knew you were alive. When I was able to breathe, I was actually, I was awake and I could hear you. There was petrol spurting out everywhere and I thought after I left you in the car that you'd, the car would catch fire and if I didn't tilt you back you would have died anyway because you weren't breathing so I just had to take a bit of a chance. Love it to meet you. No, Chris. thank you and very I've much. I've followed your, your career with a lot of interest. I no. really enjoyed watching you play. Thanks, mate. And particularly. So, since, what's your name? Brendan. 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 Yeah. It was a miracle that Preston survived that day, and meeting Brendan for the first time after so many years, and hearing how close he came to death, is incredibly confronting. That's. That's. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've it's been a long time since I've. I feel like this, you know, it's just, I guess seeing him and when I saw this guy pull up, I said to myself, this is, this is not the guy. And, and I heard, heard he mentioned to the guys that he was the bloke that had come to me and exactly what he explained just now, I, I remember, remember that stuff and he was the guy that done it, so. It's amazing. That is freaky. You all right? I'm just, I'm just glad I was able to meet him. I was glad. Yeah, I do miss Sydney though. Yeah. Like, the harsh reality of suicide are the loved ones left Sydney. behind. Yes. But and for Shanice Alasa and her 11 month old daughter Taya, no, they good. live with this reality every day. He, he looks so chilled in all these photos, doesn't he? He was very relaxed. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it drove me a bit insane. He was a bit too relaxed. <laughs> On the 28th of February 2013, the Rugby League world was shattered when young Tigers player Mosisi Fotoweka committed suicide. He was just 20 years old. Mosisi, or as his teammates called him Moses, had a promising career ahead of him. He'd been elevated from the under 20s to the top grade for the Tigers, but his dream of making a great debut was ruined by injury when the young prop tore a pectoral muscle and was facing months on the sideline. It was a normal day. Woke up, normal routine, he went to training early. Last thing he actually said to me, he gave me a kiss and said, I love you, so I thought that was nice. And um, I had an ultrasound that morning because we were trying to find out the sex of Taya. Then on the way home, Ben told me that he had got injured, so he was probably just upset, and I was like, oh no. So I just sent him a text saying, you know, it's gonna be all right. Um, ben told me he got injured, been there, we'll get through it. And yeah, silence all throughout the day. Yeah. What happened when you got home? I remember running into the house and I saw his phone, it was charging and like his boots and his bag. Like, he dropped it all down by the couch and um, he, wasn't, he wasn't answering me and I ran upstairs, it wasn't in the room. I ran downstairs and I noticed that the garage door was open and there was light coming through. And yeah, he was, he was in the garage. I remember screaming out his name and uh, I knew it was already too late. Mm. How did you get through the day of the funeral? I got to spend more time with him because we had a service at his house where he was actually at the house. I didn't want that night to end because I knew then it was coming to really saying goodbye to him. The worst part was when they were actually lowering his coffin. I wanted to scream and dive in there because I just was like, no, don't take him away from me. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe that I had just 
buried the father of my child. That's not it wasn't meant to happen that way. Did you ever notice with Moses that he was suffering from depression or was there anything that gave you an inkling? He had his moments. Now that I look back, I'd say, yeah, they were signs. Um, just especially when he got injured, he didn't cope with injuries well at all. He was really down in the dumps. I would have never caught it depressed, mm. but he, he blamed himself and he always wished that he was harder. And one day you'll explain what daddy did Yes, unfortunately, she's missing a very important person in her life. And I want her to give her everything and I can't give her that. So I'll do my best to explain it, why he's not here. And I hope she can understand it. <laughs> while you're depressed, you don't see anything or anyone in the world other than yourself, do you? And that's what comes across to the public as it being selfish or it being, why can't you, you tell us what's going on? But it, it's such a, you're in your own little world. It's one of those things, I mean, people look at it as selfish, you know, and when I sort of come to understand what it was, in the early days I was disgusted with myself, the way, the way I treated people, you know, in particular my family. But then I come to understand that it, it is something that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help. You know, so um, it made me feel better. So I needed to forgive myself to be able to move forward. Coming up after the break, Renny Matua opens up about his darkest moment. Every single day I lay in bed thinking that um, I was better off not being alive. And for the first time, Rennie sits down with the man that saved his life. I reckon if I was five seconds later, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Wow. And if you or anyone you know is suffering from depression, contact Lifeline on 13 11 14.